Um, often uh, when you start sharing screens and everything, uh, it, it all goes a bit strange. So um, one second whilst I share my screen. Okay, so hopefully you can see that. Um, yeah, so um, yeah, thanks for joining us. And this is some, some work that I've been doing. Um, I actually am a senior lecturer at the University of Essex um, in artificial intelligence. And this is a collaboration between Seasearch East uh, with Rob Spray and Dawn Watson, who you may know, and Natural England and the Eastern IFCA. So lots of people involved in what we were doing. And, and it's interesting here what Martin was saying about spatial scales, because we are very interested in looking at spatial scales of somewhere around the size of a Land Rover and a trailer. Um, that's, that's the kind of spatial scale we're working on. And here you can see one of the traditional parlor pots. That's a, it's about a meter long by 1.5 by 1.5 meters. Um, so yeah, that's about the size of a Land Rover we're looking at here. So I just thought I'd kind of, go right back to the beginning really and just talk very briefly about what th um, 3D is and why we use it um, because obviously in the kind of the rush to accept um, new technology perhaps um, we forget some of the some of the basics and there's terminology that's used that people think um, you know what are people talking about here um, so a 3D model is actually made from polygons um, so this shark is actually made from various squares um, rectangles and, and, and such. And where those where they meet, which is what we call a vertex, is a is one of the is a point, a, a data point in 3D space. And so when you've got those polygons, which we call a mesh, you colour those polygons in uh, with, with a texture, uh, and then you have your 3D model. That and that's basically what it's what it's constructed of. So you've got points uh, in 3D space, which is the point cloud. Um, join together, you create polygons, which is a mesh, and we color them in and you have the texture in the 3D model. Now photogrammetry works by taking lots of images and with a, some very clever software, it calculates the viewpoints that, um, that it's looking at and places data points within three dimensional space. So what you're looking at here in this church is not a picture of a church, but a, a um, a series of data points in 3D space that are coloured uh, the same colour as the dot from several images that say where it should be. Uh, and this is the the viewpoints of the cameras. So the camera the camera went around the church and a little bit over the top and you can see the diagonals where it, is, it was taking the picture. So that's what um, photogrammetry is. It's a process called structure from motion and it builds the structure of the model from the motion of the camera. Okay, so um, often um, people try and do this process by, by um, standing still and turning around in a circle. And that doesn't work very well because what you actually need is to move the camera around and not, um, and not just turn it. So, that, so photogrammetry is what we use to collect the data. And obviously that allows us to create a three-dimensional model of marine environments from a, a, a small to a very large scale. And once we have the 3D model, we can then perform some quite impressive um, ecological measures on that data that we can't do in any other way. For example, we can estimate the volume of substrate, which you just couldn't do without actually digging it up. We can estimate color and track that over time. And we can also measure things like complexity and rugosity, which I'll come on to in a second. And I'll just mention it briefly, but we can also, now we have a 3D image of a habitat, we can also print it out in 3D as well using a printer. Um, and we can print down to 0.2 millimeter resolution um, at Essex. Um, and, and that allows us to have physical representations of the reefs that we actually dive on. So just show you how this works. This is a, oh, I remember diving in Indonesia. Um, so this is a, a quadrat uh, survey that we did in Indonesia, two meters by two meters uh, square uh, with a tape laid over the reef. And you can see here, you've got um, overhanging acropora corals, um, you've got sponges, you've got boulder corals, all this kind of stuff, and also a sandy substrate as well. And what you do to collect the information is 
you can or, or not, as the case may be, mark out the quadrat. Then you move the camera over the top in what's, you can either think of it as a crosshatch pattern or a lawnmower pattern. It's called various, various names. And what you're trying to do is create um, images with an overlap of each other by about 60%. And often this is done using video, um, although photo um, um, time, time lapse photos uh, produce um, sharper images, of course. So that's how we collect the data and build the model. This is um, the software that we use for the whole process. Uh, and I'm and I'm not going to go through it in detail, but just, just to say that all of this um, is uh, accessible to you to use. So the first thing we do is extract the, the um, still frames from a video. Uh, and typically we use one frame per second extraction. And there's a bit of soft free software that we use to do that. Um, and then we just color, color correct them and white balance them as well if we need to. So now we have a folder full of images, let's say 100 or 200 images. And we import those into a bit of software called Agisoft Metashape. And for that, you can get a 30 day free license. And for um, the standard software, I think it's um, 60 US dollars. I'm not on a commission. There are other bits of software that are um, open source and some that are comparable. Metashape is just the one that I use. Um, and in that process, um, all you do is dump those images into a folder in the software and you follow a process of um, aligning those images, uh, building the, um, the, the, the clouds and, and then applying the meshes. And I'm gonna see if I can um, do that. I'm just gonna stop sharing that one. And uh, where is it here? Share this one. So this is um, um, Agisoft Metashape. Uh, Meta and you open a folder, you just drop the, drop the images into this folder here, into this chunk, just drag and drop. And then you go up to the workflow and you click align photos. And what that will do is build you what's called a sparse cloud, which is what you see here. So this is rough, rough data points that will align the cameras. So you can see if I move it around a bit, that it's a 3D model. And I can actually put the, the cameras back in by doing that. So you can see now where my camera was and where those images were taken. And actually in this one, I did a circular pattern, not a cross hatch pattern. Just turn those cameras off. You then go back to the workflow, you build a dense cloud, which basically adds even more data points in. And so now we're almost at something that looks like the coral reef, a coral reef, <laughs> chalk reef. And then again, back to the workflow, just click uh, build the mesh. And as we know, what that's gonna do is join the dots. So we can see that here. If I just zoom right in. So this is very detailed. You can see the polygons here on the model. And then finally back to the workflow, build the texture. Texture That just colors it in based on the, um, uh, the camera, uh, the images taken from the camera. So here we see the, the fully textured model. Okay, so I'm, I'm assuming no one's taking notes, um, but really the, the intention of showing you that is just to say that it's a drag and drop point and click process from taking a video of the reef to having a 3D model. Um, and hopefully it, it's something that people can get the hang of. So let me just flick back here to my slideshow. The final stage, once you have your model, if you want to share it with people, is to um, upload it to something like Sketchfab, um, which will host the model for you and you can share and, um, uh, and play with the models online. And I'm just gonna copy and paste this into the chat window. If I can find the chat window. Uh, oh, I can't see the chat. One second. So there's a couple of links in the chat window of those models and you can actually open them up. You don't need any special software to do that um, and you can explore the models and they're all public. Okay, 
So that's how, how we build a 3D model and share it. And a couple of years ago, um, we got invo um, uh, involved with Natural Englands and they wanted to do an investigation of human impact on a chalk reef based on some evidence that was provided uh, by Sea Search East. And what, we, what they wanted to do was um, categorize um, the risks to the chalk reef from human impact. In the um, MCZ process for the, um, for the uh, Chroma Shoal MCZ um, indicated that um, fishing activity was a, a, a low to negligible risk of damaging the chalk reef, but clearly the evidence that was shown by Sea Search East showed that that was not the case. So Natural England wanted to um, provide um, further evidence on this. So the way we did this um, was actually built a multi-camera um, device that allows us to very rapidly take the images that we need to build those 3D models. And we used the fishing, the fisherman's shanks, so this is um, what you see here, um, as a belt transect. So they were about 200 meters long with about 10 pots on each approximately. And we dropped down one marker buoy and we'd scan the whole way along with the camera. And it'd take about mm, 30, 40 minutes. We did one in 20 minutes. Um, just depends how fast you swim really. Um, and that allowed us to build a 3D model of that 200 meter by approximately six meter belt transect afterwards. But the point is that data collection was very quick because we had a very limited time and we were on HSE rules. So it was um, uh, yeah, very expensive to do it, to collect the data. We also, and we were interested in the types of chalk damage. And this is quite unique to the, I think to North Norfolk, um, that there's lots of elevated chalk. So the type of damage you get is very different to places such as Kent, where you have a lot of chalk, flat chalk, chalk pavement, as we would call it. And so the kind of damage that we see in North Norfolk is, is quite dramatic at times with huge areas um, smashed to pieces, um, not necessarily from fishing damage, but from other reasons as well. And looking at the data that we collected, we, um, we estimated that there, there was 11 different types of damage that could be attributed to human activity. Now we wanted to correlate um, the types of damage that we saw to the fact that um, potting was happening on um, a complex habitat. And the way we did that was to take these uh, 3D images that we, uh, 3D models that we had um, taken along the shank and we measured um, various aspects of complexity. Um, and one of them, the, the simplest one was rugosity. And what we did with the model is take a, a virtual slice through the, in, uh, through the 3D model. So you can see with these yellow lines here, we took six slices through that piece of the chalk there. And this is the kind of the bumpiness that you see. And once we had these lines, we could then actually work out um, what the rugosity measurement is, which is basically the distance of that line uh, divided by uh, the, the complete um, distance of the measure. So it's, it's a replacement for the, um, the chain that you would drape over the, over the reef. And this is something that's very good with um, 3D models, very quick to do. And there are other me measures that I won't go into, but um, vector dispersion and fractal dimension that we've used. Uh, and they give us an even better estimation of the complexity of the habitat that we're looking at. The uh, report was published um, at the end of last year. Uh, it took us a really long time to get it out there um, because there was a lot of um, checking going on and, and extra information being added. And it's instigated a, um, quite a lot of action. Um, in particular, the um, Eastern IFCA uh, implemented an adaptive risk management approach for the Chroma Shoal MCZ um, to minimize the chalk damage in the short term. Uh, and that was actually quite a dramatic um, a dramatic impact from our report, because actually the Eastern Ithaca said, well, if we don't do something, we close the fishery. Uh, and that's a fishery that's been around for generations. So this, the method that we used and the evidence that we produced had a huge impact on the thinking of, of fisheries authorities. Uh, so this, was, this all happened very recently in the last couple of months. And actually um, in the next few, few weeks, I think there will be passing an emergency bylaw that will require the the inshore fishermen to have an annual permit and to label their pots and buoys, which is something that they don't do at the moment, which is, you know, arguably poor practice for fishing. 
And the way Sea Search are going to get involved is to actually monitor these areas uh, for damage and for chalk erosion. And we've also been talking about having uh, a recovery group for lost gear. So actively fished gear that's that's properly set and recovered regularly is potentially less damaging than lost gear with lots of rope and pots just rolling around on the chalk reef being buffeted by the by the wind and waves. So the idea with the lost recovery group, uh, lost gear recovery group, is to work with the fishermen and to find out where they've lost stuff and go and, and go and recover it for them, or or mark it with boys so that they can pull it out themselves and to make it safe. Um, but as this is this is something that's very happening very recently, but hopefully things that we can do in uh, the summer this year, COVID allowing. So the last thing I want to talk about is how Sea Search can use these three D models to support um, the forms that we fill in. Um, and again, this is something very new, and I've been talking to um, Charlotte and Robin Dawn and various others about how we do this. And at the end of the dive season, uh, such as it was last year, I went out and I, with a single GoPro, which is most unlike me, I usually have many more cameras attached to me than that. And I pretended I was just a, sea, a normal sea search diver going about my business. Could I take 3D models very quickly? And so what I did um, was chose a, chose a representative area of habitat that I knew was gonna be one of my uh, two or three habitats on my form. And I did a scan um, of that area. I put down um, an object of known size, which is my dive knife, and it was pointing north. So that in the model, I now have um, something to scale everything by, and I know how it's orientated. And it's something that I carry with me all the time um, that I can add into the model. I then spent just over a minute um, recording the area on video. Uh, either I tried two methods, one with a, like a circle that was getting bigger and bigger, with a knife in the center or a cross hatch just kind of going up and down with the, the attempt to um, scan a two meter square area and basically um, I'd say two meters because you can do these things using arms width which is a, which is a great kind of sea search way of doing things just say go in a line and then go an arms width to the right and go in another line those that's the kind of methodology I was following and then process the video and see if it worked and those are the two videos that I've just, the 3D models that I've, I've put in the chat window, those are the ones that I produced using this method. So I think it's, you know, it, it adds um, a, a real um, addition to, to see such data. Not only do you get a 3D model, so a digital representation of where you dived, but you also get, uh, as, um, as we talked about in the last talk, this representation of what it was like to dive there and obviously videos and photos can give you so much of an idea, but to actually have a 3D model you can play with and zoom in and out of and, and virtually dive that area gives you that kind of next level up um, of, uh, of sort of visualization. But, uh, and again, as Martin has mentioned, it's not that um, there are problems taking, uh, collecting this data and um, seaweed is, is an algae, is probably the worst thing um, to deal with. Uh, because anything that moves in the model um, will be ignored in the process. So on the one hand, that's quite good. If you've got a floppy bit of seaweed, um, it disappears. And you can see here the red weeds on top of this chalk didn't come out very well because they were moving around. And so they just disappear. So you get to see what's underneath, but you don't, it, it just cannot model seaweed. And similarly, if you've got lots of fish and things, uh, divers even, moving about and getting in the way, they all get removed out of the 3D model. Um, I don't need to tell you a lot about turbidity and fluff and sand in the water. You experience it on a, on a, a dive basis. Um, and, but just to say, I, I have built some 3D models in absolutely hideous conditions um, with visibility down to about probably 10 centimeters. Um, it is possible to do um, uh, photogrammetry in, in awful conditions. At Essex, we've, we're trying a, very, a whole bunch of various things um, to do with this. So we want to go up a scale and get the largest area that I've done in a single dive was 30 meters by eight meters um, using this rig here, which has it's got eight cam, uh, six cameras on. Um, did that in, in 40 minutes. Uh, and so it's about scaling up 
And we've also scaled down so we can we can take 3D models of things at very, very tiny spatial scales as well, if we have the right cameras. We've also got an ROV uh, and a sea scooter for doing very rapid scanning as well. And that's just, again, just stuff that we're doing um, to explore the technology really. Um, I'm very interested in working with Sea Search. I've been a Sea Search surveyor for, for many years. I'm very happy to talk about ideas people have um, that may involve any of the tech that we have. Very happy to get involved in stuff. Um, the stuff I've talked about, obviously, just want to thank um, the team at Essex, Jess and Lewis, um, Natural England and Eastern Ithacus, because they've been very active in, in helping us do this. Um, our funders um, from ESRC, who've bought most, uh, most of our equipment, and obviously Rob and Dawn from Sea Search East, who who have uh, um, you know are the champions of of the chalk MCZ and and provided that evidence early on to help um, uh, inform the decisions of Natural England and Eastern Ithaca. So it's been a real team effort up there, and and hopefully we can carry it on in 2021. All right, thanks for your attention. <laughs>